Hey guys, this is Charles with Shutterstock. This is gonna be Premiere Pro Playbook, part two. If you haven't seen part one on the Shutterstock channel, definitely go check that out. I'm gonna cover 10 more tips and shortcuts that I use all the time in Premiere Pro. All right guys, so the first tip is gonna to be to render and replace dynamic link comps in Premiere Pro. So you may already be familiar with dynamic linking and that's sending a clip to After Effects directly from Premiere. You can see I can select a clip here, just right click. We can come up here and select replace with After Effects composition. And that will send that clip to After Effects where you can do more intense visual effects work that maybe we couldn't accomplish in Premiere Pro. And that's what I've actually done with this clip here. You can see it's pink. That'll usually be the default color for a clip that's dynamically linked. But if you want to, you can also zoom in here and we can see it's a .aep file. So that is an After Effects project file. And we can actually scrub through here in the timeline and we can actually see you know, the result of that After Effects project directly in Premiere. This is great, but sometimes depending on the amount of effects you apply, this can get really laggy when you're trying to like scrub through and preview it back in Premiere Pro. So a lot of times you might resort to actually exporting this out and then bringing that clip back in. But we can actually do all of that automatically here in Premiere. So on any clips that you have dynamic link, just right click and come up here to render and replace. And this will open up the settings that we can select here for the sequence. Then we can select the format we want the file to be, which is QuickTime. And there's a preset in here for ProRes and some Cineform. So I'm gonna select ProRes. And you can actually select the destination if you want it to go next to the original media, like if it's an actual video clip. Or in this case, I want it to actually save where my project file is. I can go ahead and click OK. That's automatically gonna transcode that media and that quickly it rendered out and replaced that file. So if I zoom in here now, we will see it is a .mov and I can go ahead and let's go ahead and reveal in project. And we can see it's went ahead and imported that clip in automatically and replaced it here in our timeline. And now whenever we go to preview that back, it's gonna play back really smooth because it's already a pre-rendered file opposed to directly reading it from the After Effects project and having to process all that information. The next tip is gonna be creating volume keyframes on any of our audio tracks. So you can see I have some audio here in Premiere Pro and in the direct center you'll see kind of a lighter colored line and that's the volume level. A quick way is you can add keyframes and fade the audio up and down is just by control clicking if you're on PC or command clicking on a Mac. So I'm gonna hold control and just click. You'll see that automatically creates a keyframe so I can do a second keyframe over here. And then I can just click and drag behind that. You can see how I can move and fade the audio up or down if I need to raise or adjust volume levels. And so I can create as many of these keyframes as I need depending on whatever I'm working with. But another trick we can do is get really precise with our audio levels by holding control. So on this first keyframe, if I actually click it and I move it around, you can see we're adjusting the dB there. We usually can go down to about close to negative 30 dB before it goes to negative infinity. But let's say we wanted to go a little bit lower than negative 30 and obviously not go all the way to negative infinity. If you hold control when you're dragging this around, you can see as I slide it, it's gonna give me really precise measurements there where I can actually go much further down than 30. You can see I'm getting like negative 60 right now. But if I go ahead and drag this up, I can also get really precise. If I just wanna bump this up a little slight bit. So holding control and clicking or command and clicking on a Mac gives you the ability to make really fine tuned adjustments to your keyframes and your audio levels. Next, I wanna show you guys how we can denoise audio from Premiere Pro by round tripping it over to Adobe Audition. So I've got some audio here. I'm just gonna drag and drop into my timeline. And this is just some quick test audio that I recorded. But one thing that's really important with this is you want to have some room ambience. You can see I've got some just blank audio here at the end. And that's gonna be really important for us to use when we denoise this over an audition. So in order to do this, just select your clip and just right click. And then come up here and we're gonna edit clip in Adobe Audition. So I'm gonna click that. And that's gonna automatically render out our audio as a new wave file. So it actually won't affect the original audio at all. It'll create a brand new file and replace that in our Premiere Pro composition. And it's also gonna automatically launch Adobe Audition. So what we need to do here is I'm gonna click on the current time indicator up here and I'm gonna hit I and that'll just create an endpoint and the out point should be at the end. So you can see this white area is just over that blank audio section of our audio. I can go ahead and preview this really quickly. So again, that's just the room ambience. And what we need to do to denoise this is come over to effects, then come down here to noise reduction and then select noise reduction process. And because we just have that blank ambient audio selected already, we can go ahead and select capture noise print. And that will sample that ambience noise. And then what we need to do now is just select the entire file and go ahead and click apply. And that will denoise all of that audio. And to ensure this gets sent back into Premiere Pro, just come up here and go to file and then save. 
and then we can go ahead and close Adobe Audition. Then we can go ahead and jump back over to Premiere Pro and we will see that our audio has been replaced here. You can see we even have this new audio file that just has audio extracted after the original name. And let's went ahead and place that in Premiere Pro. We now have the denoise version. Now let's go ahead and listen to a direct comparison of a before and after with the noise reduction clips. All right, this is some example audio for the Premiere Pro Playbook Part 2 denoising section. All right, this is some example audio for the Premiere Pro Playbook Part 2 denoising section. Next, let's look at how we can change the frame rate of a clip in Premiere Pro. So in my project panel, I have several video clips. Let's say the project I'm working with is 24 frames per second. So we can see most of these clips are 24 frames per second. But I've got some clips here that are actually filmed in 60 frames per second. And to convert these, it's really easy. Just click on your clip, right click, come down here to modify, and then go down to interpret footage. And that'll pop up these modify options. And the first one is gonna be frame rate. And just click on assume this frame rate and then type in the frame rate you want the clip to assume. So I'll type in 24. Because our original clip was shot at 60 frames per second, when we convert that to be 24 frames per second, it's gonna slow it down by about half. It's gonna give it a little bit of a slow motion feel, but it won't be choppy. It'll just be formatted for our 24 frames per second project. And then I'm go ahead and click OK. But something else you may not know about if you already knew about that is you can actually do this to multiple clips at once. So I have three other clips here. So I'm just gonna click on the top one, hold shift and click on the bottom one. Then we can just right click, come down here to modify, do the same thing again. Change this to 24. And that will actually change all those clips at once. You can see they're all now 24 frames per second. Next, I wanna show you guys how we can easily add a time code on top of our footage in Premiere. Now, occasionally you may have a client request for you to put a time code on whatever project you're sending them. And that's usually because they wanna screen that project to a group of people and they can easily make notes on what time different things occur on screen. And Premiere Pro has a time code effect built right into it. So if we come over to effects and just type in time code, we will see that. But actually for the best results, I don't recommend applying a time code directly to each of these clips or even on an adjustment layer. What I recommend doing is having your sequence ready to go and just before it becomes time to add the time code to it before you actually render, you can see I'm working with this main sequence. What I actually recommend doing is find that sequence in your project panel and just drag and drop that into a brand new sequence. So you can see we basically duplicate that sequence, but it's basically nested all of our clips as one. And this will make things a lot simpler when you're using the time code effect. So now I can actually select the time code effect, drag and drop that onto my sequence. Now we can see the time code appearing here. And if I scrub through this, it's going to be going up correctly for our shot. And we have the ability to adjust some options here like the opacity and the positioning of the time code and things like that and how we want this to display the proper formats. And then you can go ahead and render this out. It just makes that work a lot quicker. Now let me show you why I recommend doing that. So let's jump back over to our other sequence. Now let me show you what's gonna happen if I apply this time code effect directly to this clip. You can see the time code is reading out seven hours, 50 minutes, 44 seconds, and like the 20 second frame, even though we're right here at the very beginning of our clip. So that's kind of a little bit confusing as to why this is happening. But the reason it's doing that is this time code effect here in Premiere is actually reading some metadata that's attached to this specific clip. This clip came directly from a camera. And what this is actually telling us is this is actually part of the seventh hour of footage probably ever recorded with this camera. And that metadata is still showing up on this clip and that's why it's reading out on the time code. That's why I don't really recommend applying the time code effect directly to clips like this. It's much better to nest it because if you nest it, it'll automatically default to zero. But let's say you're in a situation where you absolutely want to apply the time code effect directly to a clip. How can we change this number or reset that? So all we need to do is we need to find this clip in our project panel. So I'm gonna right click and come up here and reveal in project. And now we can see that clip. Now let's go ahead and right click on it and come over here to modify. And we need to go down to time code. And that's gonna show us the time code. And that's really that metadata again I mentioned that's kind of baked into this file. But if we wanna default this back to zero, just click on this, type in zero and then come down here and click OK. And that will zero that out. You can see the time code now has been zeroed out and we can scrub through here and it's playing properly. And it's showing us the correct value, probably what you want in most cases. Next, let's take a look at the button editor and the source monitor settings. So in Premiere Pro, we have the program monitor where we can actually preview our footage and we have the button editor down here with these buttons. It's really a quick and easy way you can click on different settings like to play the footage back or maybe take a snapshot, export a keyframe or maybe turn on the safe margins. But if there's other buttons you wanna see down here, it's really easy, just click on the plus icon over here. You can just drag and drop these other functions in here. One I really like is this global effects mute. So I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. And actually one other thing, when you have this open, you can rearrange the order of these buttons as well if you wanna tweak the order of those. But what the global effects mute button does, you can see I've got some VHS effects applied to this clip. If I go ahead and click this, 
it'll actually turn off all the effects in our timeline. So this can make it really easy to scrub through and preview everything. If you just want to check time, then you can click that back on, it will turn all the effects back on. But let's say there's some functions in the button editor that I want to access, but I don't want to necessarily have them here on the button editor toolbar. What you can do is this little wrench icon, if you click this, this will basically show you all those options that are in the button editor, but you can just quickly access them from here without having to have them on the toolbar. So we have things like show the rulers here. This can allow us to add guides on top of our footage, you can see. And if you wanna turn those back on and off, you can come down here and click that here. Another one I really like is the comparison view. So I come here and turn this on. It'll take a screenshot of whatever clip we're looking at currently. And then we can move this over to another clip in our timeline. We can compare and contrast between the two. And then you can go ahead and turn that back off from here as well. And that's the in and outs of the button editor and where you can access those monitor source settings. Now let's take a look at measuring time with in and out points. So in our timeline in Premiere, we can set an end point really easily by pressing I on the keyboard. Then I'll create an end point. And then we can set an out point as well, pressing O on the keyboard. And then we can drag these wherever we want them to be. So if you're just wanting to render out a specific area on your timeline, you can just drag these one at the end and one at the beginning. And that will make sure when we export this, it'll just export between those two. This is a quick way to make sure that you don't export anything you don't want. Now what I use the in and out points for most frequently is actually measuring the time and the distance between two clips. So you can see I've got a gap here. Let's say I need to create a graphic to fit in between these two clips. And I don't want to create a graphic any longer than I have to. So I need to figure out a way to measure between these two different clips. And it's really easy. So if I just set the endpoint here, and I can kind of snap this if I have snapping turned on to the end of that clip. And then the out point here with this one. So I need to know exactly what the distance here is. Well, if we come right over here, we actually see the exact in and out point duration. So that's going to tell me four seconds and five frames. And you can see as I drag and adjust this, that's going to update. Again, this is really convenient if you need to find out the length of a clip or maybe you're measuring the distance between two clips if you're needing to create some graphics. Now let's take a look at how we can edit the names and the colors of labels. So you may already know about labels in Premiere Pro. You can see we have different colored clips. And if you wanna change the color of a clip, just right click on it, come up here to label, and you're gonna see we have all these different colors we can choose from. Now the default naming of the colors in Premiere Pro is a little bit unconventional and can be confusing. And I also think that some of the colors are a little off-putting because they're almost too dark where you can't really read the titles of the clips that you have in your timeline. But I'll go ahead and show you a quick example of this. So if I click on this clip and I right click, and I'll cover it a label, let's say I wanted this to be green. Well, if I come down here and select green, we're gonna see it's a really dark colored green uh, for it being green, but let's go to this other clip. I'm gonna right click. And let's come over here to forest, which we would expect to be a darker colored green. And I click that, and that actually looks more like an actual default green. So these colors are kind of swapped and the default labels and actual colors in Premiere Pro, I'm not a big fan of, but luckily we have the ability to edit all of these. So let's come over here to edit, come down here to preferences and we're gonna select labels. Now we're gonna see a really cool menu that allows us to rename all of these labels and actually tweak the colors. So I can click on this and I can update this to a different color if I wanted to or tweak it and click okay. We also have the ability to change the label default. So depending on what media you import, like a video, audio, or still image, you can default to have it be one of these colors. You could also change these label color names to be something like cameras, you know, such as camera one, camera two, if you're gonna label your clips that way. And it can really help you when you're organizing your timeline. And just for the sake of doing this, I'm gonna change the forest one here to be green since it's more of an actual green color. And we'll change the green to be forest because I think of kind of a forest green being a darker green color. I'll go ahead and click OK. Next, let's take a look at how we can purge cache files in Premiere Pro. So Premiere Pro is going to create a cache of temporary files whenever you're working on a project. And this just helps so everything can preview back a lot faster and smoother. But occasionally that cache will actually fill up. And if that does happen, that can actually create some slowdowns. So it's a good idea whenever you're working on a new project to go ahead and clear out the old media cache if you don't need that anymore. So just come here to edit and we're gonna come down to preferences again and we need to select the media cache. And when we do that, we're gonna see the media cache files here and we can delete the unused cache files. So I'm gonna click that. That'll automatically clear those out. And upon doing that, you may see faster results when you're using Premiere Pro, but you can also set the media cache file location. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that's on an SSD if possible, if you have one of those, because that'll give you the fastest results in Premiere. Now something else to look at is the media cache management. You can set this to where it will delete files automatically within seven days, or if it exceeds a size limit. And you'll see, I actually have mine to do not delete the cache files automatically. And for me, this is really more of a precaution because I don't want my software to automatically delete any files from my computer without me knowing it. 
And that is really because software is susceptible to bugs and occasionally it may delete more than just the immediate cache. And for me, it's just easy to remember to occasionally go in there and clear out that cache myself. Finally, let's take a look at the RAM memory settings for Premiere. And this comes directly from Adobe's own forums and their tech support. They recommended some new RAM settings you may want to try and see if you can get some better results with Premiere Pro. So again, we're going to head back over to the preferences. Let's go over to edit, come down to preferences, and we're going to select the memory settings here. And what we're going to see is we have the installed RAM and we have RAM reserved for other applications. And typically in the past, you would probably have this set all the way down at the minimum, which is going to be three, I believe. So if I set that to three, that'll be as low as that can go. Now, per Adobe's new recommendations, they actually recommend leaving a little bit more RAM reserved for other applications, actually about 20% roughly of your total installed RAM to get better results. And this is because sometimes this can actually choke out the operating system from not having enough RAM. And if that actually happens, obviously that's going to slow down Premiere. And that's something that we don't want to have happen. But again, it varies on how much RAM you should leave depending on how much RAM you have installed. And based on Adobe's recommendations, if you have 128 gigabytes, I recommend leaving 24 reserved for other applications. If you have 64, leave 12 gigabytes. If you have 32, leave six. And if you have 16 or lower, leave three gigabytes. So try that out and see if you get better results when you're working in Premiere. All right, guys, hopefully you learned a few things you can use in Premiere. Make sure you go and check out all the other new content we have on the Shutterstock channel. And I'll catch you guys on the next one.